So welcome to all our panelists today and our attendees. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Today we are hosting a webinar session all about the chafer grub. It may only be a small grub, but in high numbers can be a very big problem and can become very costly indeed. We will cover a number of areas, beginning with the basics on chafer grubs, types of nematodes, of types of methods of control and monitoring, and some practical advice on how to deal with them. But first, let's introduce our panel for today. Alongside the CEO of Bionema and Biocontrol expert, Dr. Minchad Ansari, we have our special guests, Peter Corbett, Business Development Manager joining us from Rigby Taylor, and Philip Chiverton, Course and Estate Manager from the luxurious resort at The Grove. So I'll let them all introduce themselves a bit further uh, to let you know a bit more about them. Uh, so we'll go Minshad, then Peter, and then Philip. Hello, Raul. Good morning. Um, nice to be connected and uh, for the second webinar uh, on the chief of group control. So my experience is very much in uh, biological control. Um, I have been in the industry for more than 20 years um, dealing with uh, different uh, insect pests. Those are causing uh, trouble to um, horticulture and uh, turf and amenity and forestry sector. I would like to um, give some um, insight how basically we can control the chafer groups, um, which was actually part of my PhD as well when I was in Belgium. So um, um, all about chafer today and hope to explore them further. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter? Yeah, hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Corbett. I'm business development manager for Rigby Taylor. And basically, my role with the business is to actually try and identify and find uh, solutions for problems within the amenity sector. In other words, problems that uh, uh, affect generally uh, turf. Um, uh, my background is uh, is actually crop protection uh, on the agricultural side, um, but I'm also an environmental scientist. So I'm really interested in being able to manage uh, an ecosystem, uh, whether that be a turf ecosystem or an agricultural ecosystem, so we can achieve the end result that we're looking for. So we're looking for a finished surface uh, in this sector uh to achieve the objectives of whatever game it is we're aiming to play on that surface philip yeah hi um philip here um course and set manager at the grove i've been here for 19 years um i've been in the industry for 36 years as a greenkeeper um various experience with pests and insects and diseases throughout my <laughs> years of doing what I'm doing. Um, interest really is chafer grubs, which has been our biggest issue to control since basically 2005 um, with various uh, chemicals and obviously uh, uh, number toes the last three years with Dr. Minshad. So it's important that we continue this way because we've got no chemicals anymore. So and it's not sustainable, hence, hence why we're going down this route now. So it's been a certain journey, but hopefully we we'll continue this journey um, over the next few years and I'll eradicate this this severe pest, which is causing huge amounts of damage to courses, grounds, lawns, um, etc. Around around the UK into into Europe. So um, yeah, it's a massive uh, problem for us all to to deal with. Hence today. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, guys. So just, again, another quick message to our audience. So I'm sure many of you have used Zoom before, uh, but for those of you that haven't, if you have a question, there's a button on your screen where you can raise your hand, uh, which I'll keep an eye out for if any one of you fancy a contribution or want to ask our panel questions. Uh, and I can unmute your mic to do that. Uh, alternatively, there should be a Q&A box where you can type your questions in and I can put them to the panel live or there is also a webinar chat, which you can put them in there. Uh, so let's get the ball rolling. Uh, let's start with getting to know a little bit more about chafer grubs. Uh, Minshad, what is a chafer grub and how would you go about identifying one? Yeah, so chafer grubs are the larvae of chafer beetles. Uh, they are usually 
one centimeter to three centimeter long. The larvae are basically causing damage to planting grass root or plant roots. There are three different <clears throat> larval stages, which is a in star one, in star two, and in star three. In star one, obviously, is a um, early uh, cause less damage than L3, which is a, basically uh, the big one cause serious damage to turf. There are four different species in the UK. The first one is a uh, top, which is a Welsh chafer. Second one is a garden chafer. Third one is a summer chafer. And the fifth one is a May beetles or cock chafer. So all these fours are available in the UK, but my experience with dealing with them for a number of years here in the UK, the Welsh chafer is predominant in most of the area. It is account for 80% of the area in the UK. And then 20% is actually have a mixed population of garden chafer, summer chafer, and may beetles. Identification is very important because some of the chaff uh, uh, had a one year life cycle and other chafers has a two years life cycle. And then maybe it has a four years life cycle. So the identification is very important before planning for any experiment or any um, uh, using any product. So there's a number of ways to identify. The one is a uh, um, simple way we basically educate <clears throat> end user uh, to, to identify them based on the raster location, which is the uh, posterior part close to the anus. There is a patterns which actually identify uh, about uh, different species. So this is an easy way. The other way is to identify uh, with beetles um, and that will lead to the species. We all tell to um, Customer, those are actually encountering, send the sample, and we will be uh, send the sample. Means uh, if you have even the picture or or live samples, we will identify within a few hours, and then basically you know what sort of uh, chafer grubs actually causing problem to your turf. And what sort of ecological role do they play in the ecosystem? In yeah, well, certainly, as far as the, you know, the shape, any soil concerned, they obviously are, are playing a, a role within uh, within the ecosystem. Um, as far as uh, you know, the Schaefer uh, one is concerned, uh, its primary purpose is obviously to to feed on grass roots, uh, which is something that obviously, as far as we're concerned, within our sector, is something that we want to avoid. The other issue is that uh, you know most of the damage is not necessarily caused directly by the pest feeding. It's actually caused by third parties trying to feed on that beastie, because obviously, particularly the, in the second year, uh, the chafers themselves are actually quite a nice juicy meal and a good protein source for for birds uh, and for other uh, other mammals that want to dig them up. And often they're the they're the the major problem rather than actually the the uh, the damage caused by the chafer uh, eating the roots of the grass. So what sectors are most at risk from chafer grubs? Uh, what kind of damage will they cause to your land and how might this affect the different sectors? Yeah well the most the most at risk as far as chafers are concerned is very much what you would have perhaps called heathland uh, because the chafer as a as a beastie uh, does prefer a, a lighter soil structure uh, and obviously the larvae find life a bit more difficult in uh, in heavier soils so they will tend to be a light land problem uh, obviously some of the things we're doing in terms of artificial surfaces uh, we're importing predominantly sand. So we're actually making a lot of the surfaces a lot lighter than perhaps they would have been uh, naturally. But generally, um, you know, the chafer is related to uh, what you might call heathland type soil structures. 
Uh, and it can be very variable dependent on the site because it, it is one of the pests that actually tends to concentrate in certain areas uh, and actually part of its recovery or its uh, mechanism to survive uh, is that it encourages the rest of its species to come and lay eggs and um, build larvae numbers up together because as a, as a group of them, then their protection and their ability to carry on their life cycle is improved. Uh, and that's certainly the case with, you know, garden chafer and well chafer uh, that very definitely uh, like to actually uh, colonize an area um, and protect themselves by actually having a lot of larvae all in one space. And Phil, yeah. of course, you've yeah. had a experience of chafer grub damage. What sort of damage have they caused at the work? Uh, well, it's quite a long story. Um, our first attack was in 2005, um, which was only two years after the golf course opened, and they affected all my native grass areas, the uncut areas, and we lost all those in, in a year. Space that we sprayed Roundup in those areas. Um, so that was our first initial damage that went on for a few years trying to deal with that um, by overseeding. And then um, we started using Merit a couple of years later. And we just didn't get the life cycle. Of, of the grub, we had Hoplia melanthus, which is the two year life cycle. Um, she did eventually identify. We had some melanthus and other, other chafers, but it was mostly the Hoplia that destroyed our native grasses. Um, and then basically, we got through that phase and then it started attacking our bunker faces. Um, our tea areas, and this this continued for a, num a number of years. Um, cost the company quite a lot of money to eradicate the problem and continue with trying to deal with it and do turf repairs. I'm um, at the grove; it's pretty much zero tolerance for damage, um, so we kept investing in the merit product, but with little, <coughs> very little success in dealing with that. Um, but now, now since 2016, all our teas were completely destroyed by the grub. And that's when we managed to get hold of Dr. Moonshad, who has been helping us since to help eradicate this beast, as uh, Peter calls it. Because it is a beast, it's a tough cookie, as Moonshad would say. Tough little cookie to control. Um, uh, after British Masters in 2016, the, the grub attacked the teas and they didn't stop. That was in the autumn. And we had about six months of um, birds, badgers, foxes, totally destroying the, the turf that had been eaten. Obviously, the, the roots are gone. And uh, the, the birds were a huge problem, pretty much as well as the badgers and, and foxes. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty serious stuff. So. And we're not still for it yet. Um, we still have some chafers, you know, dealing with um, the beastie uh, by nematodes is, is not a sort of bullet. So it's an ongoing commitment to the program, which takes time, effort, um, and assistance. So but we're, we're still doing it. We've got nematodes in the fridge right now, ready to go out tomorrow, in fact. So that's our next start tomorrow. Yeah, we've had a uh, question through from Marcus, um, whether we have any pictures of the damage at the Grove? I think we might. Uh, yeah, um, I did actually got some paperwork. I don't think it's my damage, but I've got some paperwork here. I, I have one here, but uh, um, can you share this one, um, Ellis? Yeah. Uh, you can do it by screen share if you have it uh, loaded up. It's showing that host disable participant screen share. Oh, okay. let me just. Oh, 
work. I mean, basically, the, the damage is the not complete loss of turf. Um, if you can imagine a, a rotavator um, going into your turf, that's what it looks like, and complete areas of devastation. Um, and it's pictures I don't really want to see really <laughs> again. So it's pretty much disheartening. But if you can imagine a rotavator just, just going through your tees, your fairway areas, your surrounds, your bunker faces. Um, and once animals know that the grubs are in there, they won't, they won't, they won't stop. Yeah, so, so, uh, so we can, we do have some pictures, but we can't get them to you at the moment. So we will, uh, when, when we tweet out all of the questions and answers which come up during this Q&A, uh, we will attach photos and you can have a look on that at the binding yeah. account. It's just showing that the host disabled. Did you switch off that? Um, I might have forgot to turn it on, but uh, let's not worry about that now. Um, I'll have a play. Uh, so, how have chafer grubs been dealt with in the past and what effective controls are there today? Um, Peter or Minister? Well, the, I think the board. <coughs> you want to go first, Minister? Far away. Uh, historically, um, chafer grubs are being controlled with chemical pesticide. And uh, I think until 2016, uh, when chloroperifos and amidacloprids were there, they were very much part of uh, uh, routine practice. And they were the two chemicals were keeping. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the population below threshold. But then it, uh, other biological control agents, for example, BT uh, bacillus thuringiensis has been used in the USA uh, with limited area because of the high cost. The nematodes have been used widely in Europe uh, for controlling chafer groups uh, with heat and uh, mis circumstance. Uh, so people have used this uh, product. Since they're biological, they need uh, um, extra precaution, um, how to use them, uh, where to store them, and how to apply them. So there were some difficulties, and unfortunately, company, those who were selling, didn't provide enough um, training or advice. So greenkeepers or, or turf manager, whoever used in the past, were basically not able to get 100% um, 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 benefit. But now we are in the market, basically things has been changed. We are focusing more on how to apply, when to apply in order to get better control. So it's all about application. And, uh, there is a gap in the market since chemical pesticide is, is no more um, are available. Um, and uh, we have sorted out uh, all the problem associated with nematodes. So they are basically the particularly one of the, the tools now, um, and they can be used to eradicate the chafer groups and the laser jackets in, in, the, in the turf industry. Peter? Yeah, I think I mean, the important thing is uh, that we're looking at here is obviously in, in order to control uh, soil larvae, uh, somehow you have to actually get something into that larvae that is going to effectively kill it. Uh, obviously in the past we've used conventional chemistry uh, whereby some form of toxin uh, is applied to the soil uh, and that gets into contact with, uh, with the larvae. In the case of nematodes, effectively the, uh, the killing agent, if you want to call it, is actually carried by the nematode uh, and injected into the larvae. But in all of these cases, there is one thing that is that actually is common, is that the active ingredient, whether that be a conventional product or whether that be a biological live product or whether that be any other uh, product, has to physically get in contact with the larvae that you're looking to control. And uh, this applies just the same to products such as a celeprin, which obviously at the moment, uh, hasn't got uh, an approval for use. Um, whether it receives another emergency approval, uh, we're not uh, clear yet, but that will be announced one way or the other within the next sort of four to six weeks. But the key here is actually preparation 
of the, uh, the soil structure uh, that you're actually looking to control uh, the larvae within. So actually, whatever it is you're applying, whether that be nematodes, whether that be a conventional chemical product, uh, actually gets into intimate contact with the target that you're looking to control. And this is the key part of making uh, these products work effectively. Uh, and also it relates to the amount of physical dose, if you want to call it that, uh, that you apply because in order to control something, the larger it is, generally, the more material you need to control it. So timing uh, is very, very important. And generally, and it was just the same with products such as Merit, that you needed to actually control them at the, the very early stages of the life cycle. In other words, the first and the second uh, instar. And exactly the same applies to uh, any of the conventional products that are, that are being looked at um, uh, going forwards. So the key thing is actually preparation uh, of the area that you want to control, almost irrelevant of what product you're actually using to control uh, the, the pest that you're looking to manage. Yeah. Um, if I can follow up on Peter's comments, yeah, um, the, the training is is vital, uh, timing, um, and all those pieces add up to a jigsaw puzzle from moisture content in the soil. Was the most important thing for us. I mean, we're applying some dopes tomorrow, and um, I've got over thirty percent moisture in my greens right now which is making me a bad greenkeeper um, and I've been building that up over the last few days. We've just come out of renovation so we've got some holes, we've got some very drain holes, we've got some holotine holes so the surface is fairly open that allows the nematode to get into the soil um, so we'll spray those and heavily water those in. We'll, we'll water the turf first before it goes down um, avoiding sunlight because um, UV light kills an episode. So it might take near an echo at all. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's quite a bad. Um, yeah, so the, the the moisture is really, really key. I mean, it's not just you, you grab a chemical and throw in a, in a sprayer, it doesn't work like that. And it's why you need the education and, and you need the to read the um, product leaflets. So it's all about moisture, making holes, getting, getting the product, like Peter said, down to where the grub is, which can be 20 to 30 mil down. And when you have fats as well, that makes the job even more difficult. Um, so spiking, slitting, irrigation, um, there's all other things like correct mixing of the nematode as well in, in buckets with a, with a wetting agent. Uh, that's been approved for use with the nematode and you can't just use any wetting agent because that will affect the vitality of the nematode and Minch has done some lot trials on that. Um, so we, we've been doing that now for three years on green and tea areas to control. So we take even the filters out of the sprayer, um, a large nozzle, um, mix the uh, nematodes in buckets of water. I mean, the nematodes come in a, a box um, that's got some cool, uh, cool packs to keep them cool. They go straight in the fridge. Um, and we take the uh, nematodes out about half an hour before you're going to use them so they're not shot by the quick cold water. So they're more at room, at room temperature. Um, and we carry those to the spray area, mix those, very light agitation, um, depending on the rate of nematodes you're using per hectare. There's quite a few of them. I mean, Shannon probably tell you on the numbers. Um, we only do about half a hectare at a time or a hectare because it takes quite a long time to apply them. You have to water the greens first. We like water three or four beforehand, spray the, the greens straight away and water that in straight away. 
So we won't move on to the next green until we can water that green ahead and then water it afterwards to make sure that um, even pretty much like the, the green is actually saturated in water, like it's been a heavy thunderstorm, is where you want to get that nematode in those holes in, into the fat, which is really key. Um, that's the only way really it works. I mean, I was very skeptical originally how this is going to work. Um, but we, we've, got, we've seen the results now since 2016 that we've managed to nearly eradicate this, this issue. Um, I've got some pictures here, I don't know if you can see them here. Can you see that? Yeah. That's, that's some damage. Um, where we go that way? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's some powder damage there. Um, not my goal, of course, but that's pretty much, pretty much what it does. Um, so, yeah, it's just aftercare as well, just making sure it, it takes commitment, dedication. You, you, you've really got to be dedicated and committed to the program. Um, and this takes time. I mean, a lot of people don't have an efficient irrigation system when it's dry. Um, you can try water bowsers, anything like that, if you don't have it. But ir ir irrigation and moisture are the key to uh, success. Look on it. Um, getting this, these products in. Yeah. yeah. So, in terms of, because of course, chafer grubs aren't the only species which attack turf. You also have leather jackets, which are a huge problem at the moment across the country. And with uh, control approaches, it's not a one size fits all thing. So, what are the types of differences that you get between trying to control leather jacket and trying to control chafer grub? And what do people need to keep an eye out for whilst they're trying to control? Uh, Micha? Yeah, and I think the, the major thing is that, like anything, when you're wanting to control a pest, you need to totally understand the life cycle of that pest. Because if whatever product you're using, these products won't necessarily work at all stages of uh, whatever it is you want to control's life cycle. So in terms of leather jackets, um, you need to understand when, when are they going to be actually actively feeding in the soil, uh, and likewise when a, a shape is going to be actively feeding in the soil, and also when are they most vulnerable to, uh, to control. So you know, if we take uh, the shaper, for instance, we know that actually after the sort of it gets more mature in the autumn, it is more difficult to control. Yeah. Uh, but it isn't actually impossible because what we're now finding in further research is that the chafer actually becomes more vulnerable just as it's going into pupation. So in other words, when it goes from being a larvae, uh, i.e. a soil wriggly larvae, uh, into that pupation period, there, there is a point there where the nematodes can actually get into uh, the developing uh, adult because obviously it's converting from a larvae into an adult. And that's actually what Phil's doing now. <laughs> In terms of, uh, that you're looking to actually manage the, uh, the larvae that are changing within the soil structure from wriggles into actual uh, the developing adults. So that's why you've got that one timing slot for the shaper. Yeah, yeah. Now, because obviously every adult that you manage to control, you're reducing the number of eggs that are actually then laid uh, out uh, in your target areas. So it is very much understanding the life cycle. And certainly if you're wanting to use one product to control shafers and leather jackets, as a number of people, perhaps thought that uh, under the emergency approval, a product like a Celeprin would do that, it won't. Because the timings of the, when you have to have the product in the soil profile are completely different. So it really is making sure you understand what pest you're after, the time that you, you're wanting to control. And unfortunately, a lot of these things aren't just magic in a bottle. Um, because you actually need to get the things absolutely right. 
And Phil's point about the application is completely critical, is that, you know, people have said, well, hang on, if I put a bit more water on with a sprayer, uh, will that be all right? Well, to be honest, it will make very little difference. Because if you look at the amount of water you apply through an irrigation 10 minutes, compared to a few, a few seconds going across with a sprayer, you're talking of you know, a thousand fold different in terms of water. So whether you put on 600 liters per hectare or a thousand liters per hectare actually makes very little difference to getting product into the soil structure. You actually need to be putting on 10,000, 20,000 liters per hectare, uh, which is what you would do through a conventional irrigation uh, program. Or obviously in an ideal world, if it's raining, the, the rain is even better at uh, actually getting stuff through off the foliage and into the soil structure, because that's where we want the nematodes. Uh, and that's where we want the conventional products if we're using conventional products. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the, the, the soil has got to be pretty much absolutely saturated. Um, that it's, it will carry that, that, that natural that nematode down through that profile. And like you say, he heavy watering in it is the key. Um, we've got a dual approach because I'm treating leather jackets as, as well as nematodes at the moment. Um, so uh, I've seen leather jackets on the surface of the greens right now, but I've never ever seen a chafer guard a larvae on any surface at all in my experience. I've only seen the adult beetle on the surface, so I noticed a question there was. I've seen a chafer grub beetle on, on turf, and I've, I've never seen one on turf ever on top of the surface, only underneath. So, um, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll be applying tomorrow to get the jackets and, and chafers. Well, I think there is some problem uh, in your sound. Yeah, yeah. sorry, Michelle. Yeah. Is it just, it might just be an echo room? Yeah. Is there a. I don't know what's going on. No. Difficult to hear. Okay. Yeah, do you have any headphones, Phil, that you can plug yeah. in? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. okay. Well yeah. done. That's fine. Let me, try, let me see. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, let me let me wrap up with the with the question from Ellis. Is is very much um, the two um, pests are in the same vicinity. So as Phil explained that um, you can find the chafer grubs in the same course and you can find leather jacket on the same course. Uh, leather jackets are tend to more operate in a green area. Uh, this is again uh, will take some time to explain why they are in the more greens than uh, than 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 fairway another area. But uh, the life cycle is one year for chef, uh, leather jackets. So means you're starting from uh, uh, September uh, when the basically adult comes and then they start uh, egg laying and hatching and they will end up uh, feeding in uh, uh, start from the March, April, May, June, July until August. So you will encounter that uh, during this time you will have a both problem. You will have a chafer grub problem and you will have a leather jacket problem. Now in terms of the how, how to tackle, yes, there is a nematode solution which can encounter both pests at the same time. So we have uh, this biological control which you can control for not only controlling the leather jacket but the chafer groups as well. So we don't have to apply twice. So there is a solution for that. Excellent. Um, so now we've had a bit of an introduction. Uh, it's time to bring in some questions from the public and audience. So we have gathered some questions over the last week or so from people who are unable to join us today, green, green keepers, etc. Um, so our first question is from Jack, uh, and he's seen a lot of chafer grubs emerging on his fairways, uh, I presume on the golf course, uh, but they don't have to seem, seem to cause much damage yet. Is this something he should be concerned about? Uh, Mincha? Yes, I think uh, well, it's happened for most of the course um, when the population is 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 a population is low side. Uh, it might be uh, that Peter can count how many beetles um, he's or grubs he's seeing per square meter. He can map it out 
if those numbers are exceeding more than 20 or 30 groups per square meter, which means Peter has to worry about that. If the population is below the threshold, which is a, we have um, um, determined the 30 groups per square meter, then basically he can use as a, uh, a prophylactic approach, applying the method only once in a year. But when the population is below 30 uh, uh, groups, then uh, Peter can apply nematodes in the spring and autumn to get rid of uh, uh, these. This is very, very important to not to letting the population increase or above the threshold level. So uh, it, it, it is very important to monitor uh, when the beetles are coming or when the grubs are actually coming um, and then start uh, planning for applying nematodes, not just not letting them uh, to go on. Uh, if you let them go on, which means they will become adults and each adult then will lay 300 eggs. So you're basically next year, your course will have a more larvae, more beetles. Uh, so it's the, that's what I have seen um, the, the turf professional basically um, are, are saying that, oh, that's fine, there are only few, but not, you have to take approach now, otherwise it will be quite difficult uh, when they are, uh, their number is high. Uh, Peter? Yeah, well, certainly I think one of the key things uh, uh, is actually knowing the level of your pests. One thing that you can obviously do with chafers, uh, because there are uh, traps available in terms of uh, pheromone or attractant traps, uh, is you can actually set those now uh, and actually use them, one, to capture the adults, because obviously every female you capture is there, uh, is reducing the number of eggs. Um, but also you can use it to actually help you in terms of determining the level uh, of, of activity. And I guess the question that came in was uh, more about adult beetles emerging uh, rather than actually seeing um, Schaefer larvae on the surface because uh, obviously you can get mass migrations of leather jackets. But again, as Phil said, I've never seen Schaefer larvae uh, actually uh, on the surface. What we are obviously seeing in some areas is certainly garden chafer have started to, to fly. Uh, we are also picking up cock chafer, which by the very name is May Beetle. So it's no surprise that the adults are, are flying at the moment. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I've not seen any Welsh chafer actually on the wing yet. Um, uh, so, you know, we normally expect those to come a little bit later because actually everywhere else, the Welsh chafer is called the June chafer or the June bug. So perhaps it's no surprise that it flies in June rather than, uh, rather than in May. So it does tend to take to the wing uh, a bit later on. So we can actually set traps uh, to, uh, uh, to capture um, the adults. Um, these traps are two types. One is an attractant trap, uh, which basically contains uh, uh, a material in there that attracts uh, Schaefer to, to the trap. Uh, the other one is a pheromone trap. The pheromone trap, though, will only attract the males because the male, the pheromone is a female pheromone and um, they are PC, I guess, uh, and the males are attracted to the females. Um, and so you will catch the male uh, in the conventional pheromone traps. Um, excuse me, Siri's gone mad. <laughs> um, um, so effectively, there are the two types of traps. The other thing about the traps is actually setting them uh, is also important because if you actually understand how the chafers uh, fly and how they move about to find a mate, um, they tend to actually either be right up in the trees, uh, so very high, hence why if you've got a tree lined area, sometimes you have more of an issue with chafers, or they tend to be right the way down on the ground. So actually the best place to set the traps uh, is actually at ground level, whereas the conventional pheromone traps, quite often the instructions say set them at 50 to 100 centimeters off the ground. 
And certainly we found from experiments, we don't get as good a catch uh, of adults uh, from traps that are set at that height. You're better off actually using a hole cutter uh, and setting the fins down at ground level uh, and then you will actually get a larger number of chafers, uh, adults caught in the traps and also less uh, other species because one of the issues can be is that they, with the yellow fins they can attract bees and you don't really want to be attracting uh, bees uh, into the traps. So by setting them at ground level you get a better catch, uh, a better number. If you're actually in a domestic situation, um, you could probably set three or four traps in a garden and that might be enough to actually get you below the threshold because if you are controlling the female and the male uh, adults, then you may, not, you may be able to actually reduce the population through physical capturing. And yeah. I think Phil has caught phenomenal numbers um, within some of the traps um, some years. So you may want to comment on that one. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's okay, well, I, think I, I think I've sorted out my uh, technology at last. <laughs> Good, <laughs> Good. Pieces in. Um, we've used the traps now for a couple of years, I think, um, maybe three years. Um, most of our damage was around the, the T's. All our, all our T's are square and they all got destroyed and, and most of the grubs were on the out, outer edges of the tea boxes and then they moved in. Um, we put 70 traps out with a hole cutter, uh, about a meter off each tee. Um, we've got three or four tees per, per hole um, using a hole cutter. Um, now that the, the timing, like Peter said, uh, I've got records now of the past 10 years of when Hoplia uh, takes to the wing. And it's roughly about the 10th of June every year, um, within within a day or two. So I'm ordering um, 70 of the pheromone from, from Minshad now, and our 70 traps will go out towards the end of the month. Um, last year, we caught over 1,400 adults. Um, I have a guy that looks after this for me as a little project. He did it the year before. He puts the traps out, and he counts uh, how many beetles are in each trap on each area and that, and that keeps a, a record of um, what we catch. Um, so not only are we uh, spraying, we are catching the adults. So I think Minshad said each adult has about 300, 300 larvae. Um, and the golfers are fine with it. We, we put a note on the first tee with a picture saying we're trying to catch these um, June, uh, these adult beetles because they I mean I've seen massive huge swarms in in the air and I say to also the guys when they come out we go and get the mowers out and we'll just go and mow everything and try and crunch them all up because they're all on, on the surface and the, the, the swarm is very very short um, pretty much less than a week so over in a few days so as many as you can catch them in the mowers in the grass boxes um, and, and in the pheromone traps so uh, that, that works really well for us as a, another deterrent. Um, so we're, we're trying to uh, catch the, the adults um, and we know they're about to pupate into the adult. So the, the pupation stage, the, the nematode, sorry, the, the chafer grub is quite, quite weak and he's quite volatile. So Minshad helped us with uh, an autumn timing uh, for the egg and a spring timing for um, the, uh, the pupae stage. So I'm going to show you might want to iterate on yes, that. Yes, I think, uh, I think the, it, it's a great example, um, uh, Philip um, said actually, um, and we, there was some data uh, which trap works. There's a lot of confusion in industry regarding chafer groves and all, um, and uh, which basically, clearing slowly the species and all. There is a trap called the garden chafer trap. Now, it's the name said the garden chafer, which means it is only designed to capture garden chafer. But the chafer trap which we develop and uh, which is not based on pheromones, it's based on the lura, which attract male and female both. And I think that's the reason uh, Phil has a success in attracting not only male, 
but female as well. Peter point was very valid. The way you set your trap is depending on how the, basically the adults fly. So this new trap actually is uh, working and uh, we are pleased that uh, the trap is being used by many, many um, uh, people now in the UK and hopefully they will get benefit of, of, of from this. So as I said, the controlling one details uh, means you are controlling 300 their progeny in the next season. So this is very important to um, uh, uh, a common approach as well as you have a trap place uh, in June to basically mo monitor our, our, our some of the uh, the adults which might uh, be difficult for for the next season. Yeah, thanks for that. So we'll just ask the audience now, are there any questions which you have uh, for any of our panel? Uh, you can raise your hand, of course, or you can uh, put it in the group chat. Don't think we have any for the moment. Okay, so we'll carry on to our next question, uh, which is from uh, Darren. Uh, Darren has been having some problems with chafer grubs as neighboring badgers keep tearing up the turf. He's looking at using nematodes, but has heard they take a long time to work. What should he do? And is there any way to deter badgers from the damage? Uh, Peter. Oh, thank you for that one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, Mr. Badger is not the easiest of beasties to, to manage. Um, and once they've found uh, larvae, they are incredibly persistent and can actually create a cloud field um, very quickly. And really, I must admit, the only effective uh, deterrent that I've ever come across is actually electric fence, uh, which obviously is not the easiest thing to manage um, when you're on a golf course. Um, because all you can do is encourage him to try and find food elsewhere because inevitably he's going to find food, uh, but you just don't want him eating it uh, where you were. In terms of the control, um, yes, I think the issue is not that the products take a long time to control uh, the problem, it's that actually the problem uh, can't just be controlled overnight. So, you know, no matter what solution you're using, it is a long-term uh, program to, to reduce the numbers um, down to a level where either it's not worth the badger coming to feed on them uh, or uh, they're not causing physical damage to, to the surface. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, legally, there are very few things you can do to, to manage uh, the badgers other than actually trying to keep them out and that yeah. that is also a challenge because they are very persistent when it comes to wanting to find a food source yeah i think my other advice will be to pete uh, uh, what is the name is that uh, check the number um whole culture whatever you are using and see the numbers uh, the groups you are getting will tell you what is going to happen in 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 a in the future, yeah, <laughs> I can see that, but yeah. So, uh, it, it, as Judge Peter said that, I think uh, there is a list of resources available. So I would suggest that um, um, use the nematodes um, and not waiting uh, the population to build up. Yes, um, my bad, I have missed a few questions on the Q&A chat, so we'll go through a few of them now. Uh, we have one question asking, do they need specialist equipment to treat with nematodes? So I think uh, conventional equipment, what all you need uh, training and advice from us. So there is some bits and pieces uh, need to be sorted before you apply nematodes. Um, I think uh, 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 Phil probably will give uh, his experience, but uh, we experienced that um, just filling the tank with nematode and going and spraying on the wall is not going to work. So let me make it clear. And that's what happened in the past. People bought a nematode, uh, put it in the tank, and then simply put it and sprayed. And then later on they came and they criticized that it doesn't work. Now, nematodes are leaving microorganisms. They basically need to be cared before you apply. So the process is very clear. You, we also have developed a waiting agent 
which actually helps nematode to move fast and locate uh, the grubs um, in a soil. So the combination of these two things works better and provide 30 to 40% higher efficacy. So I think there is a process, there is a way, and it's not difficult. Uh, we actually hold the hand of our clients uh, through the distributor, the retailer, and we actually trying to educate them. So once you apply it, I don't think that you are going to get it wrong later on. So, but taking precaution is very important. For example, you need some moisture before applying the nematode. You need some water after applying nematode and keep that moisture level for uh, two to three days. Um, and the temperature is other area which we need to consider. Nematodes only work more than eight degrees centigrade. So if you're applying nematode to control chafer or leather jackets, so making sure that your soil temperature is more than eight degrees centigrade, um, uh, which is basically always recommend uh, late March or April onwards until up, uh, until 15th October. So there's a long time basically for you to apply. Nematode works very well in high temperature compared to the low temperature. I think when it comes to yeah. that application, actually you don't need any specialist uh, equipment to physically apply them. Uh, because remember, all you're doing with a sprayer is using water as a carrier. So or what we're actually trying to achieve is to be able to carry an even number of live nematodes uh, to the area that we want to treat. So if you wanted to, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't put them on with a watering can. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a big area, that's, that's hard work. But the key thing is actually what you've done beforehand and what you do afterwards because as Minchad just said, these are live organisms and we need to keep them alive. So it's best to apply them when the, you, you haven't got high levels of UV. Um, so actually applying uh, at, at the correct time of day is beneficial. Also, it's absolutely ideal if your soil is moist um, to actually apply in the rain because conventional rules about when you apply things go out of the window in this case, because actually we just want to get them into the soil profile. And, yeah. you know, anything that you can do to help, i.e. any cultural uh, uh, it, things that you can do, will always be a benefit uh, in these situations. Yeah. I just want to add to the Peter question very quickly. Um, the Everybody knows the thatch layer, and there are some basically thatch building. Um, so I know that there is a lot of cultural practices going on and tough professionals are trying to reduce the thatch. So once nematode land, or you spray with a conventional sprayer, they simply land on your grass. And from there, they want to make their way to grubs where they're sitting. Now the grubs are actually sitting two to three centimeters below your thatch layer, yeah? So you just imagine when they are, uh, uh, they are dropped uh, on, the, on the soil, from there they have to find now how quickly they are going to penetrate um, through the thatch layer is a challenge for them. So we also advise that if you make a tiny hollow coating before applying your nematodes, which Phil has already done, then basically you extend greater chance for success what Peter said is not, not uh, uh, wrong, is that you can apply and a saturated soil will also help nematode to penetrate through the, through the thatch layer as well. But I think uh, managing with, uh, with more cultural practice uh, probably will, will help a lot. And make, as I said, this is a course for uh, uh, another day to giving you example how tiny they are, how quickly they can move, how fast they can move, what energy they have. A lot of things is behind the nematode. So it's very tiny, tiny, is about half a milli millimeter size. So you can imagine the question will be how far they can move. Well, they can move 10 centimeters in 24 hours. Now, how they can move? Yes, if there is a larvae, so the larvae basically will release CO2 and this, this CO2 actually will attract nematode towards them. So there is a lot of uh, things are there. Uh, roots also release chemicals, which chemicals actually attract nematode towards them. So there is a multiple factors here, which uh, uh, basically uh, 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 are, 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 
are there, but this is something fundamental, not for you. But I think uh, you can use the conventional, but provided by you do the uh, tiny hollow coring, uh, basically before applying the nevator. Yeah, I mean, uh, tomorrow we're, we're going to go out with a sour roller. A lot of green keepers or sports um, guys will know what a sour roller is in a couple of directions, um, just to make as many holes as we can and then spray that on and water it in. Um, it might take a few days to do that because um, we have golf to think about as well. We're a busy golf course, so it will take us a few days. We'll, we'll only do half a dozen greens at a time. We'll do them very early in the morning. Um, you know, for four o'clock in the morning, we'll be in. Um, do it for a couple of hours and then stop. We even do evening shifts as well. So we'll come in at eight o'clock at night after the golf when it when it's cool and the sun isn't out. So. You know, like, like Minshad said, it, it, it's the norm goes out of the window and you just need to think differently about things and have a, an approach of, OK, how many greens have I got? How long does it take me to spray? What's my irrigation system like? Can I get four greens really, really wet and aerated ready? Can I maintain that? And then can I do another four next day, next day, et cetera, et cetera? So it's not going to be a, a two hour thing. Put an nematode in the spray, off you go and it's done. It takes a completely different approach to make this work. Um, so that, that's my only advice, really, of, of, um, of how it's worked, worked for us. Um, with irrigation, with lots of holes, and uh, a, a, a different approach on how you, how you treat this um, to yeah. avoid the, the, the yeah. damage we, we've had. Yeah, we just had a question from Sean, just popping back uh, to what we were discussing earlier about beetle traps. Uh, is there a particular brand or supplier that you would recommend uh, specifically for the domestic setting? Uh, domestic. I mean, as far as the uh, the trap we're talking about with the attractant, um, those are available on the Rigby Taylor website. Um, so if you just pop along there, they can be purchased straight off the website. And, you know, they are in stock at the moment, obviously, knowing how many people need is going to be a challenge, but uh, they are available um, through the website. Okay. Um, yeah, we have another question. So some people have recommended garlic oil, molasses, kingpin to control these pests, but they don't seem to work. So why will nematodes work? Well, I think, if, um, it is very tricky, um, um, and maybe uh, Peter will add some his comments later on. But my understanding is that there is a very complexity um, in a turf environment when you are using products uh, without knowing that they might have a negative um, impact on other products. So it's very nice to have an IPM system, integrated pest management, but it is very vital or important to know what product you can combine and what product you can't combine. And I think the turf industry is still early days in, in terms of uh, classifying what product uh, uh, they can combine and what product they can't combine. I can give you an example in the horticulture industry. I have, I'm dealing with there as well. They are quite well known. Uh, they are quite aware of the products, um, not to apply and product apply. In terms of these two products, uh, without doing more detail uh, in general these products are are different and uh, classified to do a different job uh, products have a different mode of action now in order to design to kill plant parasite nematode it's very obvious that that product will kill our nematode so there is a two kind of nematode one is the nematode which is uh, a plant parasite causing uh, 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 root damage and then nematodes the one we are supplying for controlling um, controlling uh, insect so it's very obvious without saying anything that how we can recommend um, applying both uh, uh, at the same time but i think there is a way to do this one if you have a problem of uh, of chafer grubs or anything what all you can do this is not tested yet is that um, you apply your uh, any garlic or any other product you want to apply uh, and then apply nematodes four or five weeks later, thinking that uh, during this time their effect will reduce. I don't know. Uh, it need to be tested basically. 
uh, that's where basically you, you 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 can do until unless you have a concrete evidence which suggests that you can combine two products together. Most of the chemicals are fine with nematodes, except a uh, uh, very toxic one. Those were gone from the market. But uh, fertilizer uh, products, um, fertilizer can be mixed with nematode without any problem. Some of the chemicals as well. Uh, um, we, we have seen that acelaprine is quite good. So uh, it can go with nematode without having any problem. Uh, but testing their compatibility is very important. Peter, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, you know, one of the issues everyone is facing is that, uh, that actually that everyone would love to be able to control, you know, soil larvae. And actually, as you can hear today, it, it's not easy to actually manage uh, soil larvae within there. And certainly there are a lot of people who claim all sorts of things for all sorts of products. Uh, and really all I can say is that actually, you know, if you do want to use a product, just make sure that it has been properly researched and actually there is support uh, behind those particular products because it's quite easy for somebody to say something. Uh, but actually if they are claiming nematocidal activity or uh, insecticidal activity, actually if the product works, it should then be registered under the pesticide registrations or it should be exempt, which obviously, because we're introducing nematodes, which are natural insecticides in many respects, um, then actually you are legally allowed to uh, introduce those to the environment. So it is an area, and because lots of people are desperate to try and find a solution, you know, unfortunately there is an awful lot of uh, uh, claims being made by a whole range of different products uh you know the other challenge is for somebody to register a product it is phenomenally expensive under the registration systems to actually get a soil insecticide registered because it is a very very complex environment that you're introducing it to and as we said before any product that you're applying onto the soil in order for it to work has to be freely available within the water course within the soil that effectively means that the, that product, whatever it is, will also actually drain out and end up in the water courses. And with the Water Framework Directive, any product that is found in the water will actually uh, be a problem and you wouldn't be allowed to register that product uh, if it was found at above, above 0.1 part per billion, which is effectively one paracetamol in an Olympic sized swimming pool is the um, sort of concentration that products have to be below in order to be registered uh, within, the, within the UK for use anywhere. So check out the claim and check around. And obviously, unfortunately, it's, fortunately or unfortunately, it's much easier nowadays with the internet to be able to find both good information and an awful lot of very bad information as well. So do check things out. Yeah, so just going back a little bit to... Alice, uh, sorry, Alice, maybe you want to take point a view from uh, Philip. He has already yes. ended the point of view. Yes. What's that? So I mentioned. Sorry, yeah, you um, wanted to say that you were pointing on these uh, two products were mentioned. I mean, you are very much end, end user. You are on practice. So you, you can tell your um, experience. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to sell loads of products you know there's so many sales reps out there that want to sell you something i think it works um oh john just bought me some dinner look i've been i've cut green this morning well at 5 30 and i've got some got some <laughs> yeah. thank you john I'm, <laughs> awesome look at that um i won't eat in front of you guys <laughs> um but yeah i mean i've, I've tried various different products I'm not going to mention anything but you know, they, they don't seem to work or someone will, someone will say, oh, it works. You know, I've tested it at home in my lab but or their garage or their front room. But, um, you know, it's you have to commit to a biological approach and you have to stick to one thing and not keep trying different things in, in, in my experience. So um, merit didn't work for us. Um, 
especially hot pellet because it was such a tough cookie to kill, especially in the, in the, in the third instar stage. Um, e even the chafer grub itself was hard to get that. Um, but, you know, we have to commit um, environmentally to, to these products and we all have to, you know, sorry to say, wake up and smell the coffee and, and we just have to go down that route, um, sustainability and the an environment and that's what we have to do. So, but it takes time and effort and I know I said about it before, but we're in our fourth year now and we're still applying and we're still seeing activity. I mean, I've got birds pecking on my greens now for leather jackets, they're on the, they're on the turf. Uh, I've got birds pecking on the front of the approaches. Um, so the, the only way is, is the biological route. Um, so that's what we continue to go down and I'm not interested in other people's products that they think it can work. So you just got to commit to it. It's very easy to say, oh, I didn't work that way because I haven't done it right or didn't work or try something else. So um, you just have to stick to one approach, commit to it and keep going. Yeah, thanks for that. Sorry, uh, sorry to be blunt, I'm very no, direct. That's fine. So. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, yeah, so just uh, earlier on, uh, Minshad, you mentioned about how nematodes can be applied alongside some fertilizers and stuff. Uh, we have a couple of questions along, along those lines. Um, so can nematodes be applied with compost tea? And how about wetting agents? And how does application alongside fertilizers and insecticides work? Yes, this is a very good question. And uh, if you ask, uh, if you would have asked three months before, I wouldn't have said about the compost tea, but we did test it now, compost tea. And it seems to me that uh, nematodes are compatible with uh, nematode, uh, the compost tea, so they can be applied. And um, regarding um, wetting agents, uh, we tested about uh, 40 different kinds of wetting They are not there are about 60 different kind of weighting agents in the market. Um, in general, 10% weighting agent can kill the nematodes, some percentage. So starting from 10 to 100%. So there is a very uh, crucial, basically, is important element here to um, whether or not you can use weighting agent. But uh, it's very much uh, if you are. Uh, Mind of your distributor, a distributor like Rugby Taylor and other, I'm sure they have all the information whether or not you can apply this one. Um, they won't be selling basically the waiting agent which can harm nematodes. So it's, uh, it's very obvious, but uh, checking waiting agent uh, uh, before applying uh, is important. This is a very quick job we can do in, in a few hours' time um, and you provide your results. So again, such as you are sending some sample for application. You can send material as well and see, look, we have two meter of waiting agent. We don't want to buy other. Just want to see that whether it's working or not. We can do for Q quickly for you in confidence and then it will save your money as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, also, um, so how soon after treatment with nematode can the surface be played on? Is it the next day? Do you need to give it 24 hours or? I think this question yeah. keeps coming. I had a few times before as well, um, and it depends on basically, uh, I would say precautionary, you, it takes about two to three hours to uh, act here anyway. So I don't think there's any time gap where you need for uh, leaving them one hour, two hours before they can play. Uh, but if there is a cons 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 consistent, um, um, on the ground uh, and uh, while they are still finding their way to move up, will be difficult. So I will say it take one hour basically precaution, but uh, once you are using injection or you are using uh, holocoring before applying nematode, I don't think there will be any problem because they will be just slimed uh, through the holes and they will go uh, down two to three centimeter and they will start working. But just take a precaution for one hour before you can start playing on them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That, that's quite that's quite difficult practically for golf. But it um, mm. as long as like you say it, it's it's tricky. But as long as you they're watered in and and they're, and they're done, I think I think we're good. I mean, mm. we do have a soil injector 
that only works on flat areas. Um, I hope people would make one of one of these. I think and you can see mm. the the soil injector. Um, but like I say, the conventional sprayer works. Um, and uh, but, but basically, it's 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 uh, to get that in, that in and, and safe and, and and out of the way into the soil is is the key. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Uh, so yeah, let's just check in with the audience. Is has anyone got any more questions? Uh, just post them on the Q and A or in the chat, or even raise your hand if you want to uh, join in and ask them live. Um, yeah. Otherwise, let's just move on to the next one. So, in terms of the usability of nematodes, are they will where they are in the country affect how they are used? So conditions such as soil type, um, soil pH, uh, you know, areas of high moisture or even areas of low moisture which don't get much rain, how might that affect whether a golf course or other style of thing can use yeah. the nematode? <clears throat> yeah, this is called biotic and abiotic factors, um, which includes, you know, soil temperature, um, soil um, um, types, um, and also the area. This area has been researched a lot for nematodes. Um, so when you have a heavy soil um, and the less weight, there is a problem. The sandy soil and uh, basically where the nematode feel more comfortable, but if the dry soil is, if dry is there, then they will, they will quickly die as well. So our recommendation is very clear. Um, that we need four to five millimeter water before applying and four to five millimeter after applying. So you're basically not saturating them. You are making sure that there is enough moisture where nematode can move in, within soil. So the nematodes are tiny um, animals, like uh, if you have seen any, any, any worms kind of things. So they need a film of water to moving from one place to other place. So you just, uh, imagine now that you have something wriggling and worms. If they are just moving slowly uh, from one place to other place, and there is nothing surrounding their, their, their body, the body will crash within a minute. So it is very important that nematodes are basically surrounded. So there is a layer of, nemet uh, there is a la layer of nematodes, sorry, layer, layer of water, which is actually surrounding nematode and which facilitate nematode to move from one place to other place. The other thing is that the soil particles actually filled with water. So this is not a problem for nematodes. Water is there. But those waters, if they are in the less, it's called the capillary um, requirement as well. If those are less, then nematode will have problem. We also said this one to horticulture industry that you need, um, it's called a, um, uh, water holding capacity, which means you just um, you know handful of water soil and you squeeze it. If the you see the uh, water is, is dripping uh, between your fingers, which means that that soil is perfect for nematode or any other microbial application, basically. So these are very practical things. If the soil is dry, there is a chance that a nematode will be actually killed within uh, within a few hours. But this is, a, this is a quite big area, uh, explaining in all uh, sort of um, um, uh, environment. So uh, turf industry is quite good, basically. If you apply water, they hold water, and then that's where the waiting agent actually is helping. So waiting agent, we recommend, uh, is actually providing longer, longevity of moisture or retention of the moisture for penetration, a spreader. So all these contribute, uh, all these attributes actually is included in our uh, uh, waiting agent, which actually helps nematode to move faster and also find the host quickly as possible. Mm. Uh, yeah. So we did have a couple of other questions based a little bit off track about plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, so. Firstly, to Minshad, uh, what is the interaction between, of course, bionema is all about the nematodes at the moment. Uh, not purely, but a lot. 
Um, what is the interaction between bionema's materials and plant parasitic nematodes? And then maybe, Peter, you could talk about what products there are out there to deal with plant parasitic nematodes. Yeah, I think the, in terms of the interaction, then Peter can explain that. In, in terms of the interaction, there is no problem. So both nematodes can live in the same area, same environment, same soil, without interfering anything. The only thing will come your products. And uh, if the product is being used um, for controlling plant parasite nematode, which will have an uh, impact on your... Uh, <coughs> so uh, in terms of the, it's called the uh, microbial community. Community. We are not talking about just nematode or, or bad nematode or good nematode. Microbial community, we're talking about whole range of bacteria, fungus, protozoa, uh, insect mites, all sorts of things. And they all actually live together in harmony without actually, there might be some, some, some negativity in on, but if you take a, a handful of soil, you will find a dense of bacteria and nematodes actually there. So these are, uh, area which is well researched and then uh, there is no issue uh, between the two nematodes but there is a problem when you're applying to kill one and then you need to know whether or not this has an impact on others. Maybe Peter wants to add something on this. Yeah I think the thing is we've got to think about is we are dealing with that with the soil ecosystem and actually if you take uh, nematodes as a group uh, they are the most numerous of any uh, living beastie out there. So actually, you know, the numbers of nematodes that are in the biosphere and predominantly within the soil uh, biosphere is absolutely phenomenal. So they are an absolutely critical part of the ecosystem and the interaction between them is a competition because nematodes, like any species, compete for space within an environment and certainly the issue we have with say plant parasitic nematodes is quite often we actually create an environment that actually is much more beneficial for the bad nematodes if you want to call it that the plant parasitic nematodes uh, to develop and to to then become a problem and certainly if you take you know say the football uh, situation where we've actually got uh, a very light soil, plenty of water in the soil profile, uh, lots of nutrient, and then just to help things along, we make sure that it never goes cold because we heat it up. Uh, you've now got a perfect breeding environment for nematodes. And quite often, the plant parasitic nematodes can outcompete. Uh, the antagonistic nematodes, in other words, the nematodes that would normally control them uh, in the natural environment. And that's then when you have problems with particular species causing physical damage uh, to the crop, i.e. the turf that we're wanting to manage. You can control them, uh, but you are using a nematicide. And by its very nature, because we've just talked about the wide spectrum of different nematodes that there are out there in the environment, uh, there is always a danger that when you control one form of nematode, you actually have a negative impact on other forms of nematodes. So certainly using conventional nematicides, it's very much about making sure you get the balance right between what you're using, why you're using it. And also again, about timing, because again, parasitic nematodes come in different genera, and some of them live inside roots uh, and others live freely in the soil. And certainly when you've got a, nem a parasitic nematode that's actually in the cyst uh, or in the root gall, uh, then very few nematicidal products can actually get at them. So actually the control of those is all about timing, is that if you're using a nematicide, you have to time it for when what they call the J2s, uh, which are the nematodes that then spread uh, the disease or the vector that they're carrying. Uh, when they hatch out, then that's when you need to be controlling them. So again, no different to actually controlling soil larvae, controlling nematodes uh, or bad boy nematodes, if you want to call it that, is all about knowing what you're wanting to control and timing 
and using the right product at the right time. So it is a very complex uh, issue because as Minchad and everyone else has said, the soil is a very, very complex interacting um, ecosystem. And if you do things to, to get things out of balance, then inevitably that can create, uh, create issues. And by the very nature of what we're trying to do to create a playing surface, uh, we are actually putting that whole environment under stress. So we need to make sure that we look after it to actually manage that population uh, within that soil environment to uh, encourage the things that we want and discourage the things that we don't want. And that actually is a pretty good definition of, of ground management, green keeping, uh, if, per se. I think I just <clears throat> want to add to Peter, this question came last time as well when we were dealing with uh, Q and A for leather jackets. Um, maybe Peter to organize uh, um, uh, in future or suggest we can do a session for plant parasite nematode because this is an area which uh, our audience actually keep asking. Uh, as Peter explained that uh, there are some are ectoparasite, which means they are feeding from outside the root. Other was endoparasite, which are actually going inside and feeding. And the time when you are applying your nematicide, it's very important. So if the nematodes are feeding inside, which means there will not be any effect. So knowing the timing and all application, and I stress that this is a bit more about that, uh, when the timing will be, how do the soil sampling, um, how the, the number is, is coming, which nematodes are there. I mean, there are a number of nematodes, as I said, those are feeding outside. Uh, so you need to do your soil analysis first. And there are a couple of people who can do this analysis. And then, I mean, I will very much uh, to explore in, 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 in detail. And also, this, is a, this problem is, is persisting. This problem is just keep coming. Um, and this is the same environment. We have to out. We have to date, otherwise uh, uh, the audience and those are actually asking this question will not be satisfied. So we have to deal this one maybe in the, in, in, in a future Q and A. Yeah. Um, Just, mentioned if I, if I can add to that on the yeah. about parasitic nematodes. Um, I've done two construction growings now, and at the Buckinghamshire Golf Club 25 years ago, we had number, plant parasitic nematodes. Then um, again, it was all quite new how to deal with those. Um, various products on the market and, and again at the Grove we had those um, in 2005 because when the course opened when, when the greens are very young there wasn't much soil life the, the sand modern root zones now don't have a lot of soil life in them the sand's very inert and I, I think to help keep the turf uh, quality there is to keep your, your moistures up your your plant health up, don't let the plants go under too much stress. But when you do have those plant sorosidic nematodes in, in the soil, we had, we had the root knot, um, Meloida guardian minor, which was really, really bad for yeah. us, and some cyst nematode. Um, again, using various products like um, furfural and, and mustard, mustard bran, and things like that. But, but they do kill the antagonists. And I think, you know, try and change your uh, view on, on maintenance, try and keep the turf as healthy as you can to help the turf fight against that. I mean, we had to raise our mowing heights, we had to water more, we had to apply more fertilizer to kind of keep that plant strong. Um, the root, root growth was really heavily affected in those patch areas and was hard to find, you know, a, a hole position in, in, in the greens in the early days. But we're, we're through that now. The soil life is um, very, very strong and we're not you know, applying any nematicides and, and the soil life and the soil balance is, is there. Um, it depends what your threshold is as well on, on the damage to the turf, what your nematodes and, and what you have. And again, Peter said it's all timing, J2 stage, etc. So it's, 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 it's key to just ma maintain that soil health um, as much as you can to, to help. This is my, my thought, really. Yeah. Not sure that. There was one supplementary question I think that I saw that we haven't answered was do do nematodes work? Uh, and I think that that's quite a, quite an easy answer to, for me to answer uh, is that actually 
once a nematode gets into a soil larvae, whether that be a chafer or a leather jacket, then they definitely work. Uh, and I think, as you've probably heard from today, the issue is keeping them alive and getting them to where, where they can actually infect the target. Because there's absolutely no doubt that once you get a nematode to infect uh, a leather jacket or a chafer, then that larvae uh, is no longer going to be an issue because it will become a protein source for actually the, uh, the nematodes to feed off and the uh, bacteria that the nematodes uh, if infect the larvae with is actually the, the thing that kills the, the physical larvae. The nematodes that we're introducing, what they want is a food source, i.e. a protein source for their young. So that's why they go and find uh, larvae to actually then lay their eggs in uh, to actually then develop uh, into the next population. So in many respects, we're not doing what you do with a conventional product here. What we're doing is we're actually inoculating the soil with the factory. So in other words, once the soil has actually got the nematodes in it and at a population where they can manage the pest population, uh, you may not actually need to reapply product on top. Whereas with conventional products, you're actually applying the conventional product. It's no longer manufactured because once you've applied it, it effectively just breaks down. Um, so in some respects, you know, what we're doing is a much more sustainable approach where we are introducing the factory to the soil in order to do the job we want to do it. Our challenge is then, as Phil said, is to manage that environment so it allows the, the nematodes that we've introduced to survive and uh, to, to do the control that we want them to do. Yeah. Um, so just to ask our audience again, if any of you have any questions, then do uh, send them to us via the Q&A chat or via the uh, webinar chat or put your hand up and maybe you could ask them a question. Uh, otherwise, um, Phil, how has the reopening gone now that you're yeah, it's, finally it's good. I'll get to that in a minute. I just want to add on, on Peter Minchad's yeah. thoughts. Um, since 2016, we, we were applying pretty much uh, 20 hectares of, of, of nematode spring and autumn. Um, we significantly reduced that now. I think last year we applied less and the, uh, this, this year we're applying less. So mm -hmm. to answer people's questions, it is working because our damage and our thresholds are going down. Um, we don't see as much activity now. Uh, less, less pecking with birds, less pecking with badgers, less pecking with foxes, and, and the turf is more healthy. And if you keep the turf healthy, the roots are stronger. So use your wetting agents, use your, your, all your products to help that. So it's a chilled approach, really. And um, uh, I'm only applying to, uh, only bought three hectares worth this year. Uh, to three years ago, we bought 20 hectares because um, we're zero tolerance for, for damage. Um, so it, it does work, but uh, we we just have to have to um, keep going basically. But uh, opening's good. We're we we're full <laughs> yesterday. We're we're in lockdown uh, lockdown for. Uh, I've been working for like eight weeks on my home <laughs> for guys, um, but the grow's full. We were full yesterday. Only two balls open up at eight o'clock until four. We're full today. Full tomorrow. So about ninety six golfers a day. Um, but again, social distancing, there's no bag drop, there's no locker room service, there's no valley parking, um, there's no buggies unless they're on their own, there's no trolleys, no restaurant facilities, um, we've got no rakes on the golf course, there's no ball washers, there's no bins, there's no benches, um, the cups are upside down so the ball can't go into the hole. Um, They'll have us bloody infecting, uh, they'll have us spraying turf soon. Certainly I've had, I don't know how many requests for, uh, have you got a biocide or a virus aside that we can actually spray on a pitch? What I would suggest to anybody is if you're thinking about doing that, do make sure you know what you're spraying because yeah. most of the biocides, uh, you will have some fairly pretty turf if you um, spray those. 
uh, as they are. These, they will control viruses, they will control bacteria, but they will also actually uh, do a pretty good job at damaging uh, a live turf. And obviously the more, the more actively it's growing, the, the greater the damage you will see um, from using existing biocides. Um, but it is being looked at. Uh, there are a few products being tested. Um, and unfortunately, it is something that the, the authorities would love to have uh, that you could actually spray a whole pitch prior to a match yeah. to disinfect it. Um, but, you know, given what we've just been talking about, a complex ecosystem, what effect that will have on, you know, your soil ecosystem if you start doing that. Yeah. Only knows. But I know. You know, it, I mean, I, I got this from uh, Tony Beck, Hawassan. This is this from Mr. Beck. This is uh, hydrogen peroxide. So we're using that to yep. um, just in disinfect. So we've got one, one buggy raw. We, we've got uh, one guys have got this in each buggy and we just spray the steering wheel and then tractor cabs at the end of each day. So um, it's only 3%, uh, 3% uh, solution there. And it's a nasty product. It, it was makes your hands, got to wear gloves and things like that. But it's all we're doing as much as we can to keep safe, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We haven't, <laughs> we haven't had any more questions in, so we are going to start wrapping it up now. Uh, if you'd all like to just give our audience uh, you know, one or two minutes, key message for today on chafer grubs and management uh should we go peter minshad and then Philip? okay certainly from my perspective the first thing that you really ought to do is one just get your get your traps out uh, and actually monitor what you've got if you don't want to put traps out then actually keep your eyes open and look around because you know as i think has been said by several people Generally, when chafers swarm, it's pretty obvious that they're doing it. Um, but obviously, if you are looking in a small area, particularly in domestic situation, uh, you know, to manage numbers, then I would certainly recommend getting your chafer trap, get it out there now and start collecting uh, uh, and effectively killing uh, the adults. Then moving on, uh, once you know what your populations are, uh, start thinking about your critical areas, um, start planning a little bit on the areas that you're going to want to treat, and then start thinking about the, uh, the plan for you know, the coming season in terms of what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, and how you're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> from my point of view, um, as I said uh, in, the, in the beginning that there is some misconception about nematodes. So we have demonstrated um, um, trials um, at the Grove, um, Neath Golf Club and, and several others, which actually demonstrate that nematode can work and they can reduce the population. So I think there is no doubt about this one. Uh, there was some question about uh, whether nematodes are going to work or not. The other um, suggestion is that uh, uh, sticking to the, the guidelines and, and how to guide, which basically we, we provide, follow that one. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the, there is some a a aeration um, equipments before, before applying the method. The second one, apply the method with waiting agent. If you don't apply, <clears throat> simply you are not going to get added value. Uh, so these three things. And, and the fourth one is monitoring is very important. That Peter mentioned that. So, I would suggest um, do at least um, spring, autumn, um, at least monitoring. If you can do more, that's better. And keep record of um, the larval population you are getting per uh, holes or per cutter or per square meter. And you just uh, keep monitoring. If the situation becomes serious, then basically you, 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 you let us um, know. And then basically our distributor, or retailer probably will be there to, to uh, for additional guidance and support. Um, the, I can only say that we have clarified, we have cleared the cloud, uh, all the misconception, and we came to the conclusion that nematodes are working, and uh, that's where basically we want to send the message. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, for me, just to summarise, um, I, think, I think the first is to find out what grub you have. That's the most important thing. Um, you use men's shadow or any other identification you can to identify what grub you have, what, the, what, what your, your uh, time scale is. Um, and it's, it's a dual approach with, with the application um, and the monitoring. The monitoring is really key, like Min Shad said, that we, we were taking uh, monthly soil samples around the golf course in, in specific areas. It takes all day. And you just do a square foot of turf around each, each tee and you count how many grubs you have um, in that area. You count whether they're L1, L2, L3 stage in the soil. So again, at least you know the livestock you're dealing with, and then you can you know, get the timing right, like, like Peter said, where it's a spring application, autumn application. Um, so get those things right first, timing, identification, then you can uh, get your plan of action ahead. Um, and it's, it's like monitoring is key. Um, application is key. Aftercare, we've talked about moisture quite a lot. We've talked about application quite a lot. Um, there's other things you can do as well is keep your turf aerated, keep reducing your, reducing your compaction in the soil, make sure your, your roots are healthy and your turf is healthy. And then that'll, that'll help survive the, uh, you know, the, the impact that those grubs have. If your turf is healthy and more, more stronger and it's looked after better, um, that, that will help as, as, as well. Um, but that, that's, that's all really, um. You know, we'll keep going with that this year and uh, the tra traps will be out in a few weeks. Hopefully we'll catch more and um, we'll keep monitoring this, this, this summer and, and do another autumn application uh, to catch the, the eggs after the adults have been making more babies, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Excellent. that's it from me, I think. Excellent. Cheers, guys. Uh, so that just about wraps it up. Uh, if you have any more questions for our panel or more generally about Chafer Grubs, then you can send us a message via DM on Twitter. Uh, you can find us at Bionema or at Rigby Taylor. Uh, or you can contact us through our websites, of course, Bionema.com and RigbyTaylor.com. Otherwise, stay safe out there. And hopefully, if it is safe to do so, we will all start getting a bit of normality back to our lives soon. And maybe even pop round to the Grove for a game of golf. Until then, webinars like this can keep us entertained and keep us learning. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you guys for joining the panel. <laughs>